Please turn in your Bibles to the books, book of Romans. I'll be reading Romans chapter 3, verses 27 to 31. Romans 3, 27 to 31. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of a law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Blessed is the reading of God's holy gospel of justification by faith alone. Father, may we revel in what's here. So help us see it even more clearly than ever. Let this be foundational in our alone times with you as we walk through this world. Let our boast be in nothing but the cross. In your uncanny grace to us who believe. Through Jesus Christ, amen. We all know, if you know your Bible, Paul's clear on it. We've heard it a lot in the book of Romans, through sermons, that we all, by our very nature, born into this world, are children of God's wrath. Now, there's something else that's so connected to that, and I'll say it this way. That means we all, by our nature, are children of pride. Arrogant, self-centered, I'm the center of the universe, pride. Frank Sinatra's, I did it my way, not God's. Pride. We all, by that sinful nature, which in God's providence, if you've been born again, and you're different than you were than when you were born into this world, and before you were born again, you have come alive to Him. Yet that, what Paul calls flesh, the sinful nature, continually battles with your soul, with my soul. And one of the things that is at the center of it is that we don't want to acknowledge God right now. We, we want to turn to a mirror and say to ourselves, Joe, you do have something to boast about. And then we want to turn the mirror into a window so others can see and we can say and proclaim to them, look at me. I deserve some credit. Pride. When that pride is expressed, it's called boasting. And as we just heard, Paul is on a mission. He's on God's mission to eradicate all boasting in self. And the means through which God does this is the true gospel. It's what we've been reading. The means through which God does this is saving boasters. 
through the work of someone else, not their own. Through the work of Jesus Christ. And he applies it to them by faith alone. Totally apart from any of their works of obedience to God. The source of true humility is the gospel of Jesus Christ. His work and our faith. Which connects us to it. And that faith alone. Without, without any obedience to God. That's the only way someone gets justified, forgiven of their sins, declared righteous. This getting rid of boasting, it's big in the New Testament. Listen to Paul for a moment from 1 Corinthians 1. God chose what is low. It's me. And despised in the world. God chose things that are not in order to bring to nothing things that are. Now listen to the purpose clause. There's a goal here. So that, here's the goal. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Or in Ephesians 2, Paul writes... Christian, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this grace and faith is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. It's not a result of your works. And then here comes the purpose. So that no one may boast. And so for a guilty sinner, which we all are, for any guilty sinner to be declared righteous by God and forgiven of all their sins, it must happen in such a way that excludes all grounds of boasting. And that's what we read. I'm going to read again with you verses 27 and 28. That will be our main concentration this morning. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No. But by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Okay, now if, you, if you've been following through the book of Romans, do you see what Paul is doing? Right here, verses 27 to 31. This is one reason why having a paper Bible is really good. You can actually see the paragraphs connected. This paragraph now is drawing a conclusion from the previous paragraph, verses 21 to 26. That's why it starts with the Greek word un, or therefore. I'm going to draw a conclusion. So what Paul is doing is, he said very clearly, as we have seen, justification by faith alone is the only salvation from God's wrath that we all deserve. Why do we deserve it? This is where he's, what he's said so far. Because of our sinful pride. Boasting. Remember the preamble to, but now the righteousness of God in Christ has been revealed, is what? It's laying out the condemnation of every single one of us. All the way back to chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 3.20. Just, just a taste of what he did so we get the flow. He started that section like this. 
The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. Claiming to be wise, that's pride. Sinful pride. That's boasting. That's arrogance. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God. For images resembling mortal man. And he goes on to say they are gossips and slanders or haters of God and insolent and haughty, boastful. And he goes on to say that deserves, in chapter 2, verse 8, those who are self seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. And the only hope is what we saw in the previous paragraph. But now, the righteousness of God, not yours, not mine, none of us have any righteousness of our own, but God's righteousness has been revealed to come to people apart from any of their obedience to God. Apart from works of the law. He goes on to define it. It's the righteousness of God in verse 22. The righteousness of God which comes to the sinner through their faith in Jesus Christ. It's for all who believe, Jew or Gentile, because we have all sinned. But those sinners, through faith, are justified. They're declared righteous, forgiven of all their sins, by God's grace, as a gift, through the redemption, the work of Christ, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's the previous paragraph. Now, starting with verse 27, Paul's conclusion. Therefore, boasting is out. That's the flow of this text. So let's, let's slow down and get what Paul is doing. In the previous paragraph, in verses 21 to 26, Paul made it clear. God can declare ungodly, unworthy sinners. He can declare them perfectly righteous. By giving to them his own righteousness. And he gives it, Paul says, freely. It's a gift. And he says it another way. It is by grace that he gives it. And then he made it clear. The way God can do that and not be unrighteous himself is through the redemptive death of Jesus as our substitutionary, penal sacrifice, where He satisfied God's justice against sinners. And thus, took away God's wrath, appeased the wrath of God. The word He uses is, He made propitiation there in verse 25. In other words, so far, follow the flow. We sinners didn't do anything. That was all God's work in Christ. That salvation was accomplished totally apart from any of us doing anything. That's what we got so far. We did nothing. Totally apart from us. Before it was ever applied to any of us personally. Our, our prideful boasting, which, which is at the core and the essence of sin. 
And every Christian still battles with that. But that, that prideful boasting, the essence of sin, it's the reason we, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, that boasting is what brought the wrath of God upon us. And he just said now, in Jesus Christ, God acted to fix that problem. And he did it in such a way that God would remain just while justifying the ungodly. Okay, so far, we have nothing to boast about. We've done nothing, brought nothing to the equation except for our sin. Okay, so now, how's God going to apply that to people? Wouldn't it be strange for, for God to connect us now to that justification that Christ bought, to, to that salvation, to do so in such a way that would actually now give us a ground for boasting? would be weird. So here's the question. Through what means has God ordained that a sinner be justified by Jesus' work? Declared righteous, forgiven of all their sins. Saved. Well, let's put some options. Maybe God can say, okay, Christ did the work now, let's see who's going to get saved by it. Okay, I, I, we'll do it this way. I'm going to take every, all of humanity throughout time, and I'm going to put them one at a time in a group of 100 people. And we're going to have a 100-meter dash. And the top 10 of every group, those are the ones I will justify by Christ's work. Of course, that's not going to work. Because then those ten would have something to boast about. I, I, beat, I beat the other guy, and I beat him, and I beat them. I did something. Or if you don't like running, maybe you're a good speller. I would totally never be justified here. <laughs> and, and you have a spelling bee. And the winners get justified. Or maybe make it those who perform the sacraments of baptism, the Eucharist, of penance. And those are the ones that will be justified by Christ. That doesn't work. Because then you would have something to boast about over those who do not perform the sacraments. Or say, well, the way that Jesus' work gets applied to you is, now hear me, you need to say the sinner's prayer. And if you do that, you're in. It doesn't work. You'd have something to boast about. I mean, after all, you went to the evangelistic crusade with your friend and he or she didn't do it. You're, you could be decades in as a Christian and you still got siblings. They didn't do it. But, 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 but somehow, because you were morally better to figure out that that's the truth. Jesus is the only way of salvation. You did that. You'd have a little bit to boast about. It ain't going to work. God must connect us to this salvation in a way that excludes all boasting. And that's what Paul says in verse 27. Therefore, after laying out this glorious gospel of Christ's work and propitiation for our sins, therefore, what becomes of our Boasting. Here's the answer. It's excluded. Well, how? By, by what kind of law is boasting excluded? Is it excluded by a law of 
works? Answer, no. But it's excluded by the law of faith. Boasting is excluded by the law of faith. A sinner is justified before God not by their obedience to any law that God gives, but only by faith. In Jesus Christ. Paul's point there is that the law of Moses would not exclude boasting if the law actually taught that obedience to the law, to the Ten Commandments, to love God, to love your neighbor, to don't commit adultery or steal. If he taught by your obedience to my commands, you're justified, then Paul's saying the law would not have in any way excluded boasting. But that the law would exclude boasting if the law had taught that a person is justified by faith in God's grace alone, alone, alone. Martin Luther added the word alone to his translation into German back in the 1500s. And he's dead right. The word alone isn't there. The meaning is clearly there without works of the law. You heard of the solas from the Great Reformation. Scripture alone, Christ alone, grace alone. Sola fide, Latin, faith alone, right from this verse. Because that's what Paul is clearly teaching. And he will go on to unfold how the law is a law of faith in chapter 4. Let's read verses 27 and 28 again. Slowly think about them. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No. But by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith. Apart from works of the law. In other words, if boasting is going to be excluded from our justification, then it must come to us. We must be justified not only by faith, but by faith alone. Totally apart from any obedience to God's law. Faith without obedience to God's moral law. That's what he's teaching. Let me, let me, if I had a board, would you sit here? It would do math. Justification, it's a New Testament word, not just a systematic theology word, so we should know it. Justification, or flip it around, put justification here. Faith alone, that's just faith, equals justification. Paul's going to get to chapter 6 of Romans, sanctification, which comes out of justification. But don't confuse them. Don't confuse them. If you teach, be very clear about this. If one teaches that we must have faith to be justified, but not faith alone, but faith mixed with obedience to God's law, then you add boasting. 
And then you destroy the gospel of grace. That's why the Apostle Paul was so angry when professing Christian Judaizers went to his churches in the region of Galatia after he left and said, let us clean up a little things that the Apostle Paul gave you. And they told these Gentile Christians, Paul got that right. You have to have faith in Christ and in his death for your sins and in his bodily resurrection. Paul was spot on, but you in order to be justified, must go on and add works of the law to your faith to be justified. Just, when I say Paul's anger, it is his angriest letter. Let me just just hear the Apostle Paul in response to this when he writes to those churches. First he says to them, look, years ago, I had a conversation publicly in front of the whole church with the Apostle Peter, Paul says. And I said to Peter, Peter, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith. In Jesus Christ. And so Peter, we also as Jews have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. And so he says to these new Christians, let me ask you only this. When you heard that gospel, Barnabas and I and the group came and preached to you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law? Or by hearing with a heart of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by faith, you think that now you keep or go on or can get justified? By works. He goes on to say in that letter, you're severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. He closes that letter out saying about those professing Christian Judaizers. They desire to have you circumcised. And do that law of Moses so that they may boast in your flesh. Here's one of the reasons we sing songs like we sang this morning. But far be it from me to boast. Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's point is clear. It's faith. It's faith all by itself. Apart from anything that that faith produces. Apart from any obedience to God's moral commands. Apart from the way he puts it here, works of the law. Which don't exclude boasting. What are they? Those works of the law that do not exclude boasting refers to the things any person does in response to God's law in the Bible. Like circumcision. Kosher diet. Do not murder. Do not steal. Worship God and bring a sacrifice. It refers to anything a person does in response to God's commands in, here's the key, in order to get justified. Or in order to be declared righteous. In order to have their sins forgiven. In order to become right with God. That's a work of the law. 
that does not exclude boasting. If any of us sinners try to do anything besides trust God's grace in Christ in order to get right with God, then we're doing a work of the law by which no one will be justified. Boasting is not excluded by works of the law, but only by faith alone. Now, briefly, one major commentator on the book of Romans, Douglas Moo, if you need a commentary on Romans, he's one I would recommend. Here's his summary of this passage, and I'm going to read it because I think he's dead on and he's right. It doesn't mean he's right, but I'm, I'm going to argue that he, I'm arguing that he is. Moo writes, Paul's point is that the narrow focus of most of his fellow Jews on the Mosaic law as the system within which their relationship to God was established gives rise to an implicit boast in human achievement. What a person does in obedience to the law becomes, in some sense, and to varying degrees, becomes critical to one's own righteousness. Once it is seen, however, that God's righteousness comes to people apart from the law, there can be no more cause for any pride in human achievement. Think he's right. Works of the law equal boasting. Faith alone, apart from any works, equals no boasting. Paul goes on, what do you mean, Paul? Just for a moment, or we'll be getting there in the weeks, but if you just go down five sentences, four sentences probably, chapter 4, verse 4 to 5, Paul says this to help clarify for us. Now to one who works, okay, this is Paul's idea of a work of the law. To one who works, his wages, there you go, that's something you earn, his wages are not counted as a gift but as is due, and we all know that. I mean, you would be offended if you get paid every two weeks. Well, I don't know what, how they, now people don't even go do it. We used to have to go in the office to pick up your check. So okay. <laughs> here's a gift. It's not a gift. You owe me. We had, a, we had a deal, a tit for a tat. That's no gift. I earned that. You owe me. That's what Paul's saying here. To the one who works, you want to do it that way? Well, his wages are not counted as a gift, but what is due. But watch this. To the one who does not work, does nothing in the sense of an obedience to a job task or a command. Nothing. But instead, believes. There's the verbal form of faith. Believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith. That is, the faith, he says, the one who does not work without works. His faith is counted as righteousness. The essence of faith. Faith. In other words, by its nature, what is that? that therefore, there's no boasting. Think about your own faith. If you really just get everything, up, forget about what it's producing, everything. What is the core of that faith? Faith is that thing in you that, by definition, it looks to the object of its trust. That's it. That's all that core, the core of faith, that's all that's doing. When it starts to do something else and look elsewhere, it's no longer faith or trust in the object, which is the gospel. Christ crucified for you. So if a person says, well, I don't like that. 
I mean, I don't want to be like a three-year-old and just live on handouts like that. I want to do something. I want to earn it. Uh, give me a job to do. I'll do it so that I can collect what I earned. Like justification, or salvation. When, 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 when someone has that attitude, think about it. Where's all the attention go to? It goes to the earner. It goes to the one who accomplished the task. And that's why the work of the law does not exclude boasting. I mean, we're in the midst of, of metaphors of, of this called the Olympics. And you watch her race and touch and win the gold. She has something to boast about. You just saw, you know, a minute 23 seconds. You didn't see the last 10 years and thousands upon thousands of horrifically strenuous, boring hours of swimming and a coach yelling at you. All the work is put in to accomplish the pride, the goal. But faith's not like that. Faith, it calls attention not to itself. You can say, I'm, I'm a person of faith and I'm looking at my... Okay, no, no. I'm talking about the essence of faith at its core. It does not even look at itself. It, by definition, goes to grace. The gift. The beauty. Christ. Our propitiation. Our joy. Faith, it's synonymous with the word trust. Trust, by definition, has an object. And that's where its attention is. And that's the heart of justifying faith. I mean, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, when he's starting to watch the flesh and boasting come up, <laughs> what do you have that you did not receive. If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? So, the Protestant Reformation back in the 1500s, it was one of the things at its core was a retrieving of what was always crystal clear right there in the New Testament, the gospel. So, the Philippian jailer, at midnight, ready to almost kill himself, he's so terrified. What must I do to be saved, Paul? Silas? And they answered him. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. And they meant it. That's it. Faith alone. To, to believe in the Lord Jesus, what is that? It is to believe the message of His redemptive work. It's not about religious functions. It's not about obedience to tasks. It's about a teaching, a message, a message about Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, and the Savior. It's what it's about. It's a message. This is how Paul said it in, later on in Romans. How are people going to believe in order to be saved? How are they going to believe in Him? Of whom they've never heard. They can't. How are they going to hear without someone preaching? And how are they going to preach unless they're sent? 
As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. And that's why he says, if you, anybody in the hearing, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, yeah, it's how my mind works too. Okay, Joe, I believed. Look at that, I did that. How is that not a work? There's two ways. First is because of the nature of what faith is. Trust. In other words, as we see, what is faith? It, it listens. It hears something. The gospel. And what is faith? Well, in other words, it, 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 it just knows. That's true. And good and desirable. Whenever that happened, it's over. And it happened at one moment, if you're a Christian in your life, and it was immediately over. It's too late to do anything to get forgiveness or to get justified. You already. Are. That's Paul's point. At the age of 19, reading the Bible for the very first time in my life on my own, I wonder why I did that. And reading in one of the Gospels in the New Testament at some point in early 1981, I was in a pitch black room. And all of a sudden, the light went on. Darkness turned to light. Like Paul said, God, the one who said, let light shine out of darkness, He has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. At that very instant, faith was there and it was over. I believe. I am in Christ. I cannot now do anything to get into Christ. That's why faith is not a do, a work. Because of the nature of faith. Okay, the second aspect is this, as I'm going to close. If any of us now, as Christians, we try to say, well, yes, but before I was in Christ, I, Joe, acted. I believed. And that believing is what turned the light on. Okay, Would any of us say that? That's why we have the Bible <laughs> to correct such wrong thinking. The light went on, and the evidence of that is your faith. It's not the other way around. And that faith itself, the Bible is clear is a gift of God's grace. I, I submit to you the Apostle Paul. Christ, are you a believer? Are you in Christ? Are you justified? If you're not, believe and you will be. But if you are, he says this, you were before that dead. Dead in your trespasses and sins. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he acted. Made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved through faith. And those two things are not your own doing. 
It is a gift of God, not a result of works, in order that no one may boast. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? A law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we maintain that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Now Paul's going to get to chapter 6. He's going to get to Christian living, to obedience to God, to sanctification. But let me just say this as I close. When you wake up each day, let this truth, justification, by your faith alone, be the posture of your Bible reading and prayer time with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, may our struggling hearts, thoughts, minds, remaining sin, all the more revel in this grace. And there's only one response to grace. Trust. Thank you.